How are you doing, 10 o'clock? Why don't you stand and join us in worship? have a desire to reach beyond the walls of the church? Are you passionate about discipling the next generation? Are you looking for a way to get involved? If you said yes, I have an opportunity for you. Kids Camp is coming up and we need volunteers to get involved. This camp isn't only about having fun, it's about children learning more about the Bible, engaging in worship, and building relationships with others.
year, we want to focus on the kids who do not already attend a church. We want to reach out to kids in our communities who have not yet had the chance to hear the gospel. Please consider signing up to serve these kids at camp this summer. We're going to have a ton of fun and also grow spiritually. After service, go check out the Connection Corner and we'll give you more information on how to get involved. Well, good morning, Experience Community Church. How are you guys doing this morning? Woohoo! My name's Nicole Hudson, and I am the Development Director here at the Cannon County Campus, and I am super excited to see each one of you this morning. As you guys saw in the video, we are highlighting our kids' camp for this year. Um, we are looking for volunteers to help out with that, and we're also asking people um, to invite people that they don't know, like your kids invite their friends or their cousins or their aunts and uncles and I don't know what else you have there. That's all. So get them to invite their friends, friends that maybe don't have a church home, uh, friends that just don't go to church at all. We would love to have those people come so that we can just uh, tell them about Jesus and maybe have them learn about him and come to know him. So we want you guys to do that if you will help us out in that. If you would like to get signed up to help out, uh, Chad's out in the foyer and he would love to put y'all in a nice little spot to run around and chase kids. Yay! Hey, if this is your first time here, reach into that seat back pocket in front of you and pull out that card. On that card is a little barcode where you can fill this out um, on the app as well if you don't want to write on it. But uh, give us your information and somebody's going to get back in touch with you this week, answer any questions that you may have um, or anything like that. Also, on there is a place for you to put prayer requests, and we would love for you to put those prayer requests on there for anything that you would like prayer in. Um, we'll be doing that this week, uh, and any week that y'all put something down, we just wanna make sure that we're uplifting each other in prayer. This is your first time here, or if you've been coming for a while and you haven't been to our next class, our next class is gonna be April 8th at 6.30 p.m. This is an opportunity for you to hear Josh's testimony, how the church came about. It's an opportunity to be able to tour the church, um, meet all the staff, and you also get a free dinner and free childcare for that evening. However, it is not a date night for any men in here to take their wives to, okay? All right. Also, if you guys are, if we have some new folks in here, something that you may not know is that we have services here for all ages. We have services here uh, for Echo Kids, which is uh, six weeks through fifth grade. They meet over here. We would love to have your kids join us in that. They have a really fun time back there. Uh, the pre-K kids and the elementary kids have their own worship service and their own teaching. So we would love for you to um, check that out. For more information on that, you can also get with Chad. We also have that for middle schoolers. Middle schoolers have their own little area downstairs where they come together and they worship each week and they have a teaching as well and then they break up into groups and talk about that. So we would love for you guys to find out more information about that if you're interested. Also, resurrection. Yeah. See, the reason that y'all aren't excited about that is because I didn't mention peeps and how they're out this time of year and you wanna eat those. Yeah, I know, I know, peeps are the best. Seriously, we just want to come together and worship Jesus and all that he's done for us in his death, burial, and resurrection, and just how grateful we are for that. So we're going to have seven services next weekend. That's going to be Friday night at 6, and Saturday at 2, 4, and 6, and then Sunday at 8, 10, and 12. We would love to have you guys come out and join us for that. Also, coming up, worship night. Hey, more than able this year. Uh, we're going to be coming together at the Murphy Center in Murfreesboro at... Uh, 7 p.m. on April 19th. We would love for you guys to come out and join us for that. It's a great night of just worshiping our Savior and all that he's done for us. Um, and uh, it's just a really special night. If you haven't been before, I encourage you to do that. Um, you can give at any of our tithing boxes around the room. Um, a lot of people, you know, sometimes we talk about money, sometimes we don't talk about money, but God has asked us to be uh, a giver of money and a, gearful, a giver of our time. So we just ask that we all be obedient in that and give as we see fit. That helps us to do more with our community. If you guys would, stand with us and we'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this morning. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity, God, just to be in your house. Lord, for the opportunity just to come, Lord, and worship. Worship our amazing Savior, our wonderful God, our sovereign God, Lord. We just ask that you would continue to be with the worship team. 
as they continue to lead us in musical worship, Lord. And we ask that you be with Pastor Jalen as he comes and leads the message this morning. Lord, just speak through him. Just use him as a vessel, Lord. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
out together. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand With everything around me is shaking I'm never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So I will Still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going the dead. I'm not held by my own strength. Sleeping my life on Jesus. He's never let me down.
come together. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't fail. Father, I'll take you today, amen. You will bow your heads and stop pray for us. Lord, we thank you for who you are. That you are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. That you are our Creator and our King, our Father, our Provider, our Protector. You are so many things to us, and you desire it. You desire to have a relationship with us, to provide for us, to be there for us. And so, Lord, will you help us in the times where we may try to go back to leaning on our own strength? Remind us that we serve a God who wants to, us to cast our burdens upon him. These burdens, sin, whatever it may be, you already bore it on the cross for us. So I pray that we let it go, that we trust in you, that we lean into you, knowing that your plan is greater. And for the word that is brought by Pastor Jalen, Lord, as you speak through him, as it is your words being spoken to us, help us to see what you are wanting us to learn this today. Help us see in your word how you are wanting us to grow closer with you to grow as a believer, as a follower of Jesus in a way that gives you the glory. But above it all, Lord, let your will be done. Have your way, Father. We love you, we honor you, and we thank you. It's in your precious, your holy name that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we praise our God one more time before we sit? Come on. Good morning, everybody. How you guys doing? Good to see everybody. Man, it feels good. I feel good? Good. Well, Nicole wants me to remind you guys one last time. I know you guys are probably like, ugh. Resurrection Weekend is next weekend, okay? And so that should be exciting. And so make sure you're inviting those that you love, those that doesn't come to church, because what an amazing opportunity for them to hear the gospel and to hear how our Lord and Savior is risen and he defeated his sin and grave. Amen. So make sure you bring somebody. We got seven opportunities for you to come and worship with us. We have a service on Friday night. We got three on Saturday, and then we have three on Sunday. So make sure you bring somebody. We love to see everybody there. So if you haven't met me yet, my name is Jalen Taylor. I serve as our student director here, which means that I oversee our middle school and our high school ministries. And so I'm not the normal teaching pastor. You're probably thinking like, where's Josh? Well, I'm just filling in for Josh for today because he's had to be lazy and didn't love you guys. So I'm gonna love you guys. And I'm going to hopefully teach the word today. And so we've been walking through the book of Galatians. And so last week, we got to see how Paul's explanation of what it means to live as as a child of God instead of a slave to the law. 
And so then he asks us, he says, hey, what comes into your mind when you think about God? Is it his goodness? Is it his mercy? Is it his grace? Is it Jesus? Like what pops into your mind when you think about who God is? And so today we're gonna be going through chapter five, and this is a hard chapter to teach. And so as I was preparing and as I was studying, man, my flesh was trying to take over. And so Paul is gonna show the difference between the freedom in our spirit versus the freedom that is in our flesh. And so today is kind of like where the rubber meets the road type of moment for all of us. And so I hope and I pray that all of us in this room will feel some out of conviction because we all have this thing called the flesh. And that is something that we struggle with sometimes even daily. And so the things that we practice will be the things that we start to perform. It's gonna be the things that we're gonna be known by. It's how people are gonna associate ourselves to the things that we do all because of what we practice and what we do day in and day out. And so if you have a Bible, I hope you do. We're gonna be in Galatians chapter five. We're gonna cover the whole chapter today. If you need any notes or handouts, it's located in the back or you can download our Experience Community app. All the things I'm gonna say is gonna be right there. We also have everything on the screens. So I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna dive into God's words. So Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much, God, for just being with us tonight, today, Lord, and just allowing all of us to gather this morning, Father. Lord, we just thank you so much, God, that your word is alive and well. And so, Father, as we open up your word, Father, I just pray, God, that you will open up our hearts. God, I pray, Lord, you will expose, God, the darkness that may be in it, Father, and God, that we will surrender it and commit it unto obedience to you, Father. God, we not only pray, God, that you just be with us, God, we pray for any church that is gathering, God, in our city, in our county. Father, God, that is lifting up your name. Father, we ask, Lord, you to be with them. And God, give us a spirit of unity as we continue to do the work that you laid out for us to do in advance. So, Father, we love you. God, we thank you. And God, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Okay, take a look, if you will, at verse one. For freedom, Christ sets us free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Take note, I, Paul, am telling you that if you get yourself circumcised, Christ will not benefit you at all. Again, I testify, and if every man who gets himself circumcised, that he is obligated to do the entire law. You who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. For we eagerly await through the Spirit, by faith, the hope of righteousness." For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. You were running well. Who prevented you from being persuaded regarding the truth? This persuasion does not come from the one who called you. A little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough. I myself am persuaded in the Lord that you will not accept any other view. But whoever it is that is confusing you will pay the penalty. Now, brothers and sisters, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. I wish those who are disturbing you may also let themselves be mutilated. And so what we see here in verse one is just a continuation of thought from Paul that he left off of in chapter four. But this verse kind of summarizes exactly what we've been reading about in chapters three and four. It is Christ who sets us free, amen? And so the freedom that is in Christ has given us the liberation from us to have to submit ourselves under the law and has come because Christ has come to complete the law into its entirety. But let's pause for a moment and let's talk about this word submission because Paul doesn't want us to, to go back into that. He wants us to stand firm and don't submit again. And so when Paul says, hey, don't submit again to the law, what he's trying to say is, hey, when you surrender to the authority of the will of another, that's what you're doing when you're submitting. Or in better words, we come under the subjection of a thing or a person that we're choosing to surrender to. And so all of us in this room, we have somebody that we submit ourselves to. It could be your spouse. It could be your husband or your wife. It could be your boss at work. Or for all of us who are believers, it could be God. 
but some shape, form, or fashion of another. We all submit to something in our lives. But what Paul was trying to get the Galatians to see is they surrender over to the law, the very same thing that Jesus just freed them from, they're just putting back on the chains and the bondage that Christ freed them from. And that's not what Christ has called them to. But you probably didn't wake up this morning thinking that, hey, I want to learn about circumcision. No. Well, newsflash, you are. So you're in for a good treat. We're all adults. We can handle this. So circumcision, what this was, is this a religious ritual and a requirement for all male Jews as a sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham. We first just established in Genesis 17. And so this act was to show that, hey, I belong to the chosen nation. And so what circumcision showed, very similar to baptism, but not quite the same, it showed an outward expression of an inward commitment to their spiritual reality. But these men who were being circumcised, what they thought was, hey, I'm good, right? I've been made righteous, right? Man, I, I, I've kept all God's commands right now, right? Because I, I got myself circumcised. Wrong. Because they didn't. And what they missed the notion was, just because Abraham told them to be circumcised doesn't mean that Abraham was preaching circumcision. But what Abraham was, was dedicated to was his faith in the Lord. That's what he was known by. Because Abraham does declare righteous by his faith. And we see this in Romans 4.12. And we also see this earlier in chapter 3 and verse 9. But the beautiful thing is, even though that circumcision isn't a requirement for believers, the physical kind, but the circumcision of the heart is a requirement for all believers. It's what God wants to do for, on all of our hearts. He wants to get rid of our sinful nature and he wants to cut off the sin that is so easily, we're so easily entangled with. And so these people, they're trying to be justified by the law. They're trying to be justified by their works. And so they were trying to prove their worthiness of righteousness by continuing to practice the law, or AKA, they were being legalistic. They were adding on to Jesus' work on the cross. And so what they were doing is they were being wrapped up in thinking that, hey, I didn't do enough. Or maybe, hey, I can earn God's favor. Can I tell you guys something just for a second? You will never be able to do enough to earn God's favor. You won't. You can't outwork God and you can't outgive God. Because when God came and he died on the cross, he paid it in full. So that way we don't have to work for this thing called salvation. All we have to do is submit and trust. And that's what they were missing out on. Because when, what's, what happens when we are legalistic and we try to add on to the work of Christ, we put the intention on ourselves rather than what Christ has done. And that's not what God is wanting to do. And that's not what Paul is calling his Galatian church to do. But you guys, I'm not a baker by trade. If I bring anything to your function, it's going to be store-bought, so I'm sorry. But when I was studying, I was like, what is leaven? And some of you who are bakers, you're probably like, I know what that is. Well, I didn't, so you're smarter than me. So what leaven is, it's the agent that causes bread to rise. And so what legalism, it causes other things to rise. Maybe insecurities. Maybe self-righteousness. Or worst case scenario, division. And so legalism causes a hindrance in a believer's spiritual growth in their maturity. And it even has the power to even divide a church. There's a reason why here at The Experience we have this saying, you major on the majors and we minor on the minors. Which means if it's not a salvation issue, we are not going to allow that to cause us to dis disassociate with one another. We can continue to live in harmony and fellowship and worship with one another. Just because you see end times this way and I see end times this way does not mean we cannot fellowship with one another. We still can. That's a minor issue. If you believe that Jesus came, died on the cross, paid for your sin, and resurrection three days later, and is the Lord and Savior, then we can still fellowship with one another. And so these, these Christians in the Galatian church, men, they would start to obligate and start to operate out of obligation instead of dedication. And if anybody knew about obligation, it was Paul. Because prior to Paul becoming Paul, he had a former life, and his name was Saul. Saul was a Pharisaic Jew. Saul knew about the obligation of the law. Saul was so good at the law that he decided to persecute the Christians in the early church. 
Matter of fact, he held the coat as they stoned a man to death. That's who Paul formerly was. And so Paul knew that, hey, once you do one, you can't just stop there. You gotta do all the others because the Lord was designed to be done completely. And that is why Jesus came to fulfill it because it has to be done completely. And so the law is a matter of obligation. If you do this, then you have to do this. Or if you don't do this, then this is going to happen. And this is not what Christ nor Paul is teaching. And so Paul says, hey, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Don't you think that they will like me? Don't you think that they will affirm what I'm teaching? But they didn't. Because what Paul and what Christ was teaching is that, hey, you have fallen away. You missed out on this opportunity that those same people who crucified Jesus rejected him. And that's what Paul is teaching. He's also shining a light onto their legalism. But then he says, man, you were doing so good. What happened? What happened? You were running your faith well. What, what happened? What, were, what went wrong? What went wrong is their legalism crept into their church. And so he reminds them that, hey, this is not what God calls you to. And so for all of us in this room, let's think back when we first became a believer, when God was so real in our life, when we were so on fire for the Lord, and we were just like, man, I got to tell everybody about it. But then life happens. Get married, you start having kids, and you kind of lose that fire, lose that reverence for the Lord. That's the same way that happens to us. A lot of other things starts to creep in, the cares of the world. And we miss out like, man, we were running well too. So what happens to us? And so Paul is trying to see them that, man, if you continue on in your legalism, Christ makes no benefit for you. The purpose of Christ coming to earth was to give us salvation, but to offer, offer us grace. It is grace that we're able to have a relationship with Jesus. And when we operate out of this thing of legalism, we separate ourselves from that grace. It's the grace of God that we're able to do anything that we're doing today. And so it's our faith working through our love. It's our faith that what matters, not our small indifferences, not how much money we got in the bank, our faith. Because when Jesus came, he ate with sinners. He dined with them. He associated with those who were disassociable. He was God in the flesh and he loved everybody. And so why should we allow our very small indifferences from keeping us from loving each other? And so we should demonstrate our faith by loving others the same way Christ has loved us. And as we do this and as we continue to work out our salvation There's a coming righteous for all those who believe in Jesus. When we get to the pearly gates and Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant. That is a joy that's gonna be bestowed upon all of us who believe in Jesus and all of us that continue to work out our faith. But then Paul says, I hope those who are misleading you and misguiding you pay the penalty. And so when Paul was writing this, there was a cult that worshiped the goddess Sisable. And what she was, she desired all of her male worshipers to castrate themselves. If you don't know what that means, I will not tell you. Go look it up. (laughs) But they got so included and so wrapped up into this false worship that the priests that worship this goddess, they end up being eunuchs. And so what Paul is trying to say is, hey, Don't just stop at circumcision. Go all the way. You want to tell these people to to do this? You go all the way. You be committed. You be devoted. But also, I hope the wrath of God is on you. Because there's a steep price to pay for anybody, including today, that intentionally misleads God's people. There's a price that they're going to have to pay. It may be on this side of eternity, but it's definitely going to be on the other side of eternity. So there's a steep price to pay, and there's a penalty that Paul wishes these people will pay. So let's continue on. Let's look, if you will, at verses 13 through 18. For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. 
Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but to serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So for the second time in this chapter, Paul reminds them that, hey, Christ has called you to be free. And so this freedom is a result of Christ's work and what he done on the cross. And so he wants these Galatians to see that, hey, they should no longer see themselves as slaves or those who are in bondage, but as free people. But we all like gifts, right? And a lot of the good gifts that we give that we get are meant to be stewarded. And so this freedom is meant to be stewarded, but not for an opportunity of the flesh, though, but as an opportunity for the spirit to work because this places a huge responsibility on the believer. And this gift that we're being given is called grace. And so this grace does not mean we get to just run right back into the chains and the shackles that God has just freed us from. Look, if you will, at Romans 6, 1 through verses one through two. It says, Why should we, what should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? And this opportunity that we've been given of freedom, it's the opportunity not to live in our sin, but to live in our freedom. And so our freedom is an opportunity to serve one another, to love each other, and to continue to carry out the great commission, to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them and baptizing them, teaching them the very same thing that we are dedicating our lives to. Because this legalism has started to be divisive towards each other. They started to treat each other poorly. And so Paul kind of takes a jab back at them. He says, don't you know that the whole law is fulfilled when you just simply love your neighbor as yourself? But those of you who are married and may have kids, you're probably thinking, man, loving somebody, it's hard. Because love is a choice. It's a choice of choosing somebody else other than yourself. But we live in a culture today where it's all about you. You're the star. You're the center of attention. It's your world. Everybody else is just living in it, right? That's what our world is walking into. But God is saying, oh, take the attention off yourself for a second. Look at your neighbor beside you. Look at the person that you may have a small indifference with. How about you go and love them? But Paul says, hey, walk by the Spirit. He's commanding them to depend on something else other than themselves. Because we're limited human beings. And so when we're led by the Spirit, we're listening to his word. We're not only just listening to it, we're following it. We're following his guidance. But as I was thinking about this walking by the Spirit, I can't help but remember when I first became a believer. I was like, man, I'm so excited. I get to actually read God's word and understand it now. Man, this is exciting. This is awesome, right? And I used to think like, man, I'm, I'm growing. I'm getting like deeper and like, this is so cool. But can I tell you guys something? Walking by the Spirit shouldn't be this huge spiritual high. Like, yes, it should make you feel good. Yes, we should celebrate when somebody starts to walk by the Spirit. But this should be the normal. This should be the normal for a believer. We shouldn't be going on these cycles of like, man, I haven't worked my word in like 10 days. No, we should be walking by the Spirit daily. It's a daily devotion. Christ calls us to pick up our cross and carry it daily. And so you walk in by the Spirit. This is a normal practice that Paul and God wants us to equip into our lives. Because when we are walking by the Spirit, we are walking in communion with God. I'm talking about big G God, the God of the universe, the God of all creation, the God that spoke everything into existence, that God. 
we were walking with him. And not only that, his voice sounds more clear and distinct. It drowns out the carries of the world. And not only that, man, his presence feels even more closer. That's that. That's what we need, especially when times get rough and things start to go sideways. But the best part is, man, we are more of the person that God intended us to be when we walk by the Spirit. Not who you pretend to be when you live in your flesh, but God intends you to be the person he created you to be, but that's only by the power of his spirit. Because it's this thing that's lived inside of us if you're a believer, man, it has the power and the, and the capability of giving us victory of our addictions, of our sins, and our desires that we so easily fall for. Y'all, the same spirit that is living in you is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave. That's that spirit that God wants you to interact with, to you to surrender over to, to lead you and guide you. Because if that same spirit can raise Jesus from the grave, he can break the chains off your addiction that you had for years. He can give you a new attitude, a new mindset, a new framework on how to operate and do this thing called life. And that's what God desires for all of us. But why don't we do that? Why don't we walk by the Spirit? Well, here's the thing. We got this thing called the flesh. And this thing called the flesh, it's not just our skin and bones. It's our natural, sinful nature. Then this flesh, it opposes the Spirit. It's like some of you guys in Nashville traffic. You oppose that traffic. You hate it. you like, I can't stand it. Me neither. I'm right with you. But a believer can't walk in the spirit and, I mean, walk in the flesh and please God. It's impossible. And so to walk in the flesh, what I'm meaning is, is us choosing to make a habit out of sinning and not seeing anything wrong with it. We just go, hey, there's grace, right? I said the sinner's prayer. I got my get out of hell free card. I can go and live my life the way that I want to. No, you can't. You can't. That's not the way God intended you to walk out your faith. And so each and every day, we got a choice. We got either to surrender to the spirit or surrender to the flesh. We can't do both. We can't do both. It's a choice that you're gonna have to make each and every day that you wake up. And God's gonna give you an opportunity to, hey, what are you gonna live by? You're gonna live by your spirit or you're gonna live by your flesh? Let's look if you will the last few verses of this chapter. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, or in some translation, it says orgies, and anything similar. I'm warning you about these things, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and his desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Now Paul mentions this thing and this notion of works of the flesh. And he kind of gives us this list. And so what I want to warn you guys is that this list is not exhaustive, which means it's not fully complete. These are only just examples. But as I was looking at all these things that Paul listed off, I noticed that you can group these things into three categories. They either deal with sex, they either deal with religion, or they deal with human relationships. But then Paul mentions something in verse 19. He says, hey, the works of the flesh are obvious. Well, they only are obvious when you've been crucified with Christ and you're a believer in Jesus and you're walking by the Spirit. Because a lot of these things that Paul listed off, our world will say, hey, those are things that are normal. Those are things that you should be doing. Hey, you should be living in sexual immorality. Hey, you should be going out and getting drunk. Hey, you should be okay with having an outburst of anger. That's not normal. That's not. Not for the believer, it's not. 
And so let's look at these three categories. Let's start off with the sexual sins that Paul mentions. He mentions sexual immorality. That's sex before marriage. That's adultery. That's homosexuality. And I'm gonna throw this bad boy in there. That's pornography. Then you got moral impurity. That's our thoughts, our words, our actions. And then the worst one of them all, the one we see time and time again in movies, billboards, social media, is promiscuity. What it means to be promiscuity is desensitized to sexual exploits or a loss of modesty. Can I, t- can I let you guys in on a little bit of secret of what I do? I meet with our middle school and high school students. And I cannot tell you how many times I've had conversations about some of these things that are on this list. Y'all, the things that are on this list are already creeping in into this younger generation, as young as eight year old, seven years old, six years old. It is a war that we're gonna have to fight against the world because they think, hey, all these things are normal. They should be wanting to do these things. They were born into it. They have these feelings. They have these desires. No, because what these sexual sins do, they rival against the covenant of marriage. Because it's in our marriage that we're meant to explore the sexual limitations that God has given us. Because marriage is between one man, one woman. And sex is used as an opportunity and a tool to bring those two together. Not to be explored outside of that. But then he mentions these things that deal with religious sins. And he starts off with idolatry. And idolatry is simply worshiping anything or anyone that is not God. That includes your finances. That includes false gods or politicians. Now, I won't harp on that the fact that we're in the election season. Hey, go do your American duties. Go vote. But regardless of who you vote for, I want to give you this little tip. That candidate that you believe in and that you trust in and you're placing your vote in, that person is not Jesus. They will not save you. They will not make this world better. They will not bring America back to what it used to be because our world is dying. It is going to hell in a handbasket. So regardless who sits in that office, God sits on the throne. He's the one that we place our faith in. He's the one that we need to be devoted to, not a politician, because they have their own desires. And so then he mentions sorcery. And these people, they're magicians. There's people who practice witchcraft. And a lot of time they, had, they practice the use of drugs. And so where we get the modern day term for pharmacy, it comes from pharmakia. It's a Greek word. And so as I was studying a lot of these occultic practice, what they would do is they would bring people together, you let them use drugs, and make them think that they're communicating with these gods and these deities. But in actuality, what they were truly doing, they were all just gathering together, getting high, and communicating with demons. And we still see that today through astrology, through rocks, through all these other sorts of demonic and witchcraft things. But then he brings out the relational sins, hatred and strife, which in a lot of time results into conflict, jealousy. Y'all, we don't have to keep up with the Joneses. Who cares about what your neighbor is driving? So what? Steward the gift that God has given you. Or this outburst of anger. You're probably thinking, man, I just did that to my kids this morning. Like, oof. It's okay. I promise. You had a moment of weakness. I get it. But a lot of these times they deal with our attitude and our motive and then our actions. But then selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy. A lot of these times things start to fester. They start to get at us. They get underneath our skin. And most of the time, they result into conflict. But then these last two, they can honestly be thrown into the sexual sins because in Paul's heyday, a lot of these occultic practice, they were all gathered together and they would worship, but really they were just getting drunk and having sex with each other. But in today's language, drunkenness and carousing, they pretty much means that, hey, we're we're just getting rowdy. I went to a concert on Thursday night on Broadway and man, let's just say the least that those people were a little bit rowdy, Okay. And so that's what happens in our relational sins. But the key to all of this is Paul's statement of those who practice. See, practice does not mean perfection. What practice is, is us creating habits. And so what it means to practice is us, something, is us doing something regularly. And so there's a clear difference from us having a moment of weakness and falling to temptation 
versus completely giving over to that temptation. That's a clear difference. And so every believer, we may not struggle with everything that Paul listed out on that list, or you may struggle with something that Paul didn't even mention, but we all have something that completely pulls us away from God because there are some temptations that we can so easily fall back into. If we're in the right environment and the right setting, we can so easily slip right back into that old sinful nature. But did you guys know that when we fall to our sin, it always starts off as a drift. It's never a drift towards God, but it's always a drift away from him. It gets us to take our eyes off of Jesus and place our eyes on this moment, on these desires, on these feelings. And we go, man, that sounds good. But that's when the drift starts to truly happen. So again, doing something once does not make it a practice. But for those of you who are continuing on into your sin, but then slap on that badge of, yeah, I'm a believer. I said that prayer at the camp one time. I'm good, right? Please do me a favor. Please stop calling yourself a believer. Because that's not what a believer is meant to be doing. That's not a believer is marked by. Not how much we can sin and get away with it. It's how much we can be devoted to Jesus. That's what a believer is supposed to be marked by. But then Paul mentions these nine characteristics that make up the evidence of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. And God desires for every believer to display this fruit. And so I'm gonna ask you guys a question. I want you to think about it. Can a farmer grow corn? You're probably thinking, yeah, duh, wrong. Farmer cannot grow corn. He can only plant it and he can water it. But it's the seed that he plants that produces that fruit that he wants to to produce. So in the same way, God plants the seed of the Holy Spirit in every believer and he plants it and he waters it. But then he doesn't place the responsibility for us to grow that seed. He grows it. He gives the growth. And so it's up to us if we allow God to grow that seed of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And when we allow it, we start to see patience come out of us. We start to see love come out of us. We start to have joy in moments and in season that it doesn't feel joyful. We start to have peace when everything around us is chaotic. That's only when we allow the Spirit to take over and allow God to grow this fruit of the Spirit. Because here's the thing. There's no work that you can do that can ever produce this fruit. The law doesn't produce the fruit of the Spirit. The only thing that produces the Spirit is the Spirit, is God. And that's what God wants to do in every believer's life. But that's only for those who belong to Jesus. And so again, I hate to continue to bring this up, but I feel like we need to hear it again. If we say we're a believer in Jesus, that does not mean we're gonna no longer struggle with our sin, our temptations, our legalism. And that there's going to be a fight that we're going to have to do daily between our flesh and our spirit. But man, it's through our faith that we leave behind the old ways and we embrace this participation in Christ's death and resurrection. And earlier in chapter two, man, Paul says, it's no longer that I live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And so your life is no longer your own when you become a believer. It is Christ who is living through you. And he wants to show that through all the other people that it's around you. He says, let us keep in step. And so the Galatians role now is to put aside their legalistic views and to live in harmony. But the only way we're able and have the capability of living in harmony is if we follow the Spirit, if we are walking by the Spirit. And so it's simply not enough for us to claim that we have this new life. We've got to continue to allow the Spirit's guidance and then we live publicly, which means when we're here at church, we're at our jobs, but also privately, we're in the comfort of our own homes, when nobody can see us. That's when we need to allow the Spirit to, to do the work. But it's simply not enough for us to talk about it. We've got to be about it. So again, let's talk about this thing called the flesh. And the flesh is full of temptation. It is. Every one of us struggle with something. I don't know what your struggle is, but you do have one. 
But then this, this the idea of temptation in its purest form, it is a lie disguised as a promise of fulfillment to be satisfied. That's what temptation is. You're never gonna be satisfied when you scratch that itch. You won't. You leave more hungry, more thirsty. You start to see yourself do it more and more and more because that sin that you continue to fall back into, it will never satisfy you. But then this freedom, quote unquote, that our flesh loves to promise us that we have, it's really just a license for us to be right back enslaved. Guys, the prison doors are open. Christ has the keys. And all we gotta do is walk out. But why do we so often continue to stay stuck in that cell and we call it home? It's not home. It's not freedom. Or we continue to put up these habitual habits that we have to maintain, have to save face, put on a mask. That's not freedom. That's bondage. That's us being slaves again. But if you are a believer in Jesus, then God wants to give you freedom. I mean, God wants to offer you this thing called, hey, work out your salvation. God has placed the Holy Spirit inside of you to crucify your flesh, to help you overcome your addictions, to help you overcome your temptations. And our spirit is the guiding hand that allows us to walk closely to God and away from our sin. But then the spirit gives us more opportunities to bear the fruit of the spirit. Have you guys ever prayed that prayer where you're in a stressful moment? It's like, God, I just need patience. Lord, I just need more patience. And then God presents you the opportunity to be patient and get upset with God because he presented you the opportunity to be patient. <laughs> Why do we do that? But well, we do that, right? Or we pray the prayer, God, I just want more of you. Lord, I just want more of your spirit. Well, you can't get more of God's spirit if your heart is full of sin. You gotta make room somewhere. You gotta allow God to open up your heart to get rid of that sin that is in your life so that you can bear more of his fruit, so that you can have more of him. But regardless of who we are and what our walk is, we all have freedom. Each and every last one of us, we got freedom. I can't tell you how to live your life. I can only suggest how you can live your life, but you got freedom. And so today, it may be a very insightful day for you. You may be like, man, that's good. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I mean, God is wanting you to change. And change is hard. It's tough. And so if today is an insightful day, then your rest of the week is your invite to change. That is your invitation to say, okay, God, I'm gonna trust and believe in what you said on what your word says. I'm not gonna trust on my own understanding. I'm gonna trust on your understanding. I'm not gonna trust on my work. I'm gonna trust on your work. And so all of us in this room, even when we step out of this building today, when you leave and get in your cars, you go home, you got the invitation to change, to be the person that God intends you to be by allowing his spirit to take over. So how are you gonna use your freedom? How, what practices are you gonna be, to be known by? Is it the way that how much you can sin and get away with it and still slap on grace? Or do you wanna be known by the way that you love others? and the way that you display the fruit of the Spirit. Can you bow your heads? Hey, I don't know exactly where you guys are in your life, but God does. And for some of you in this room, he's wanting you to change. And he's calling you back to himself. Not so that you can be better for yourself, but so that you can be better for those that are around you. Because there are people that God wants you to minister to, that God wants you to love on, but you can't do that because you continue to fall for those things that you so easily fall for. And so today is an opportunity where you can surrender that control surrender those desires to Jesus but he won't leave you empty handed he will give you more of himself 
so much of himself that you wouldn't know what to do with it. And so if you need prayer for anything, on my right, your left, there were people who would love to pray for you. If you got questions about anything, I'll be up here, Nicole will be up here, and we will love to answer any questions that you may have. But we're also gonna go into a time of communion. And it's during that time where I want you guys to, to really sit and think about exactly what we're doing. Because that blood that we're gonna drink, that blood paid the price for your sins. That blood is the grace that God has given you. So Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much, God. God, that you never give up on us. God, that you're constantly working on us, constantly striving for us, Lord, to look more like you and less like the world. And so, Father, I pray, God, God, that our heart to be open to your work, Father. And God, that we'll be willing to surrender whatever it is, God, that is keeping us from full devotion to you, Jesus. Father, I pray, God, God, that we will allow your spirit to work and move through us. And God, that we will follow you anywhere. God, I'm so thankful for this amazing body of believers. God, I pray, Lord, that you continue to give us harmony amongst each other. God, that you continue to show us how to love each other through, God, our shortcomings. So, Lord, I just pray, Father, God, that you just continue to have your hand on us. So, Lord, we love you. God, I'm so thankful for you. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may help yourself, guys.